Do you talk to caterpillars? Caterpillars might well talk to you. What would caterpillars say if they spoke to you? It would probably sound something like this. Who are you? said the caterpillar. This was not an encouraging opening for a conversation. Alice replied rather shyly, I, I hardly know, sir, just at present. At least I know who I was when I got up this morning, but I think I must have been changed several times since then. And most of you can probably identify with how Alice feels from time to time. We are what we eat. Straight like this, you'd probably be in very good shape. You can take lots of different tests to work out what you're like on the inside, your temperament, your personality. But let's go to our text. Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John the Baptist. But the interesting thing is that it's not just about John the Baptist. He's also speaking about you and me. A great thing to do is to put yourself into the Bible. Be part of the crowd. Be one of the people that are there. You'll find that the Bible now speaks to you personally because you are personally there. And look at how Jesus speaks. Almost every second sentence is... What did you go out to see? What did you go out to see? What did you go out to see? He's really pushing. This is not a wussy Jesus. This is a Jesus who's looking for us to respond, to to think deeply and to consider what is going on in our lives. So, taking notes. Here's the first thing to note. We need to look below the surface. Surface things are not who we are. We've got to get below that. And note, I am more than my circumstances. And it doesn't matter whether your circumstances are homeless in the wilderness, as John seems to be, or living in a palace in great luxury. Your circumstances are not you. It's where you live. It's not you. Blokes around a barbecue. The question inevitably comes up, what do you do? It's about circumstances. What are the circumstances in which you find yourselves? What are, what's your time? What's your income? They're all related and they're all external things. And you've been to um, the wedding and if you're a and guest, then you're probably seated right down near the toilets at the back of the, the queue. Uh, not a person of great honour to sit up near the bridal table itself. We make the problem of judging people, measuring people and assuming their value based on circumstances. It's the completely wrong thing to do. Tim Keller is a author, prolific Christian author. One of the things that he wrote that I find really interesting is this. He said, I am going to judge my circumstances by Jesus' love not judge Jesus' love by my circumstances. You pick the, the, the difference between those two? The circumstances are not the determining factor. More than that, I am not just more than my circumstances, I'm more than my successes. And you could add if you're taking notes, I'm more than my successes and my failures. Certainly, expensive clothes and indulge in luxury. That is success by the world's term. But again, that doesn't make us who we are because you have days when you're a winner and then you have the other days. When King David, the Old Testament um, leader of Israel, he had taken his nation to the pinnacle of success He'd ruled for 40 years, they had military success, they had economic success, they, they uh, had peace and uh, tra- trading links, everything was going really well. As he came to the end of his life, he said to his son Solomon, who was about to succeed him, not build great armies, not establish astute political alliances, not do well in taxation policy. Instead, he said, and here it is, do what the Lord your God commands and follow his teaching. Obey everything written in the law of Moses. Do that, then 
you will be a success no matter what else you do or where you go. It's those things, it's the spiritual things, it's the heart of things that really matter. After David's funeral, Solomon prayed. Clearly he'd taken his dad's advice on board. And he prayed, Lord my God, give your servant himself is the king he said I'm just your servant God give a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong that is the attitude that enables him to be a success and soon afterwards we have these as God's word my child do not forget my teaching Keep my commandments in your heart. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. If you do that, you'll find favour and good success in the sight of God and people. It's what comes out from within our heart that makes the real difference. Now this is not scripture, but it's a good read anyway. And it certainly is something that we can all relate to because we've been in situations just like Frodo who said, I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish none of this had happened. And Gandalf tenderly, kindly, graciously, wisely replied, So do all who live to see such times. But that's not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time given to us. And that's just as true as if it was scripture because it's wisdom. We can't decide our circumstances but we can decide what to do within our circumstances. I'm more than my circumstances, I'm more than my successes and failures and I'm also more than my ministry. Now, you thought I was the minister here. That's completely wrong. I am a minister here. I'm one of the many ministers here. You are all ministers and you all have a ministry here. You all have a way of serving the Lord. Now, for John the Baptist, what was his ministry? He was a prophet. Yes, and and he did that very well, very eloquently. He fulfilled that. You have got your own ministry as well. And what's our ministry? Well, the purpose of our church. Therefore, our ministry is twofold. To make followers of Jesus by being followers of Jesus. And so your ministry, our ministry, is one of worshipping. It is the first and foremost thing that any believer can do. We're here to learn to teach one another, to instruct one another, and that's how our fellowship works, where we're sharpening as iron on iron. We, we grow to mature. We're to be inviting others to come and join in the good things that we have found, that the good things that God is doing, so that we can all grow together. We're here to pray for one another, support one another, and to grow so that we mature and develop to become all that God wants us to do. This is our ministry. But it's not who we are. We're that plus so much more as well. So let's go back to the caterpillar and ask, who are you? Well, I'm not my circumstances. I'm certainly not my bank balance, nor my achievements, successes or failures. I'm not what my friends say about me, nor am I what my critics say about me. And I'm absolutely not an object, not a tool, or not something or someone to be used. But we still haven't answered the question, who am I? Well, let's move on. In the middle of the section, we find that we need to look through the lens of what is spiritual. You can see it turns everything upside down, but it does give great clarity. We are spiritual beings at heart. And once we've got that heart sorted, everything else starts to fall in place. Now look at this lovely thing. God prepared me for this time and this place. We've all been born of a woman, but we've been born at the right time and in the right place. And here we are in the making. 
Scripture says, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvellous, of that I'm sure. You kept watch over me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born, and every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out, even before a single day had passed. God knows you so intimately, thoroughly, exhaustively. He understands everything about you. And what's still ahead of you? He knows every moment. Not only has God prepared you in that way, God has prepared you for the other people who have already gone ahead of you in the journey. Jesus said of of John, amongst those born of women, there's no one greater than John yet there's still a greater one in the kingdom of God and and it's these people who are ahead of us these giants and spiritual giants that have made us and shaped us for who we are today look at this crowd we have these words from scripture therefore now here we are in the opening words of Hebrews chapter 12 the therefore is Hebrews chapter 11 and that whole chapter is the great heroes of faith that talks about Noah and David and Moses and uh, those who went through the fiery furnace. Since we are surrounded by this cloud of witnesses who have passed on the baton to us and are expecting us to likewise live by faith, we need to know that we're not alone in this, that we are following on those who have gone ahead of us. Not only that, God prepares me for what lies ahead of me. And it's good. God has got good things because he wants you to enter into the fullness of what his kingdom is. And we do it together, this crowd. This crowd not only of those who have gone ahead of us, but those who surround us. So look at these words. Let us throw off. Let us run with perseverance. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. We're in this together. This is what this fellowship of wonderful people is all about. So who are you? Yes, I'm the product of those who have gone before me, but I'm not the victim of those who have gone before me. I have been able to draw a line in the sand and say, I am who I was because of who's gone ahead of me, but now I am becoming someone different and I'm adequate because God has equipped me and gifted me and I'm now equipping me for what he wants me to become what does that make me? I am optimistic and I'm hopeful and I'm excited that's who I am but I need more I need to know how I now go on and live and in the last couple of verses we find that I'm to live above the level of the superficial how do I do that? first of all I need to step forward and step forward beyond just listening here in verse 28 all the people heard Jesus' words we need to do that as our starting point we need to hear Jesus' words it happens like this I hear with my ear that's just gaining information that just is the basics I need more than that So I need to not just hear with my ear, I need to hear with my mind. So I'm not just gaining sounds, I'm learning information. But there's more. I need to also hear with my heart. This is where I take it in and integrate it into me so that I can then use the information that I'm hearing. For how often did Jesus say, He who has ears to hear let him hear it's not just to stay in the ear it's to go deeper and deeper within us then we need to step forward beyond knowing these people not just heard Jesus' words but then they acknowledged that God's way was right let me give you an example of that just one of the many examples you find in scripture the people in the town of Berea 
were more noble than those in other places because, look at these three things. First, they received the word. They heard with their ears. Then they did that with all eagerness. They were hearing with their heart. They were excited by this. This was something that really got their juices going. Wow, I love this. But they also examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. They were hearing with their mind. They wanted understanding. They wanted to make sure all the pieces fitted together, that God's word was indeed reliable and trustworthy and fulfilled in Jesus. And then we need to step forward into doing because if all we're doing is just hearing and sitting back and enjoying the songs and participating at a shallow level, then we haven't got there. We've got to go deeper and it's not just to learn in order to satisfy our curiosity. We need to act in such a way as we're stepping out into obedience and the baptism that John preached, that Jesus preached, that Jesus went through, that his disciples did and called others to do. That's a basic step in becoming all that God wants for us to do. In another place, Jesus talked about those people who are the good soil and we need to be good soil. And those who are good hear the word, the word of God, and accept it. It's got to be something that doesn't just stay in our ear. It's and accept it and bear fruit. We're to be those who not just know what the Bible says, but those who do what God's word says. That will make us fruitful. And in scripture, we find that God's word reminds us again and again and again who we are. So, who are you? First of all, you're a sheep. But you're not alone. You're a sheep here in God's flock, following the Good Shepherd. You're also a soldier. You're in God's army. You're not fighting this battle alone. You've got your support network with you. You're a stone, but you're not out there just trying to be a rock in the cold. You're integrated here into God's temple. You're to be a steward a steward of God's resources because he so richly endowed you and blessed you and equipped you and gifted you. Not only that, you're a student. You're a student here in God's classroom where his word opens up to you and you get to know and understand and to grow in those things that are so rich in making you who you are becoming. You're salt. Now, one grain of salt in a meal is not going to make much of a difference but when lots of grains of salt get together then it just enriches the eating experience you're not a sinner you're not even a sinner saved by grace you are a saint and God's glory is in you as much as you are in God's glory and you're significant you really matter to God he looks at you and he thinks, wow, you are so special. And then you are secure, secure in God's family. You are safe. He, he's holding you. He will never let you go. You are a member of his family. And all of those are just some of the S words. If we were to go through the entire alphabet, goodness, we'd be here all day. This is who you are. This is where you fit. This is what God has got for you. This is what God is giving to you. This is how God embraces you. This is who you truly are. So let's ask the question. Who are you? Go and find a caterpillar. And tell, well if you can't find a caterpillar, find someone else. And say to them, I am blessed. I'm loved by God. I'm accepted for who I am. But God is not stopping at that point. He is recreating me who, into whom I can become. That's exciting. Jesus died. He did that so that my sin could be gone, but he rose again so that he can give to me his abundant life. I'm not stuck at this point. I'm moving on. My life is abundant, rich, growing and beautiful. So now 
I can live to be me. I can live to be who I am and I can live to be who God is becoming me to be. He's equipped me, prepared me, and he's got a great plan. I want to run with that plan, and I can because of who I am. So let me pray. Father, thank you that you've made me who I am. You've changed me, developed me. You've nurtured me. You've given me everything I need so that I can make a difference. Now, I want to know who I am more fully, to know who you are and then to go on and grow in you so that I truly am who I am. In Jesus' name, amen.